Welcome to Let's Talk Near Death, the podcast show where we talk about life, death, and experiences somewhere in between. My name is Kirsty Salisbury, the host of the show, and I welcome you to join me as I talk to everyday people with not so everyday experiences. You may also wish to join the conversation on the Let's Talk Near Death Facebook page or access additional VIP content as a premium subscriber via Patreon. For just a couple of dollars a month, you can get an early access to episodes, additional bonus content, and your chance to connect with my guests. To do so, simply visit patreon.com forward slash Kirsty Salisbury. Let's talk near death. As soon as I started to get out of the car, I had this weird feeling. It was like all my energy was just leaking out of my body. And I tried to get out of the car and I started saying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And that's all I remember. I was in hell for what seemed like about two years. It seemed to be segments like plays. And one situation was worse than the next. Hello, hello. It is Kirsty Salisbury here, host of the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Today, we're going live. I'm sitting in the dark. We've got a big power cut going on for the entire neighborhood. Even we've got a little island out in the bay there. The island's got no power. So I'm sitting in the dark. just hoping the best for this interview. So... If the lights suddenly come on, if I cut out a battery, I do apologize. I just didn't want to cancel today's interview because I'm so excited by our guest today. It's going to be great. We are processing this live through the VIP uh, Facebook group. So if you're a VIP subscriber, I want to say welcome. Thank you for joining us. If you're not and you want to find out more, you can do that by visiting www.patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Kirsty Salisbury. So that's how you can get the live interviews, the live updates, all of the other goodies that we have in that VIP subscriber group. But today, so excited, I have Kathy McDaniel with me, who is a brand new author with her book, Misfit in Hell to Heaven Expat. So Kathy is doing her very first interview with me and Kathy, thank you because I feel like it's such an honor when I get the first interviews with people sharing their experiences for the first time or once they've released something for the very first time. So I'm feeling very grateful and Kathy, I want to welcome you here. So welcome Kathy McDaniel to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes, I'm glad you're here. So you had a near-death experience in 1999, lung failure whilst you're in a medically induced coma. Mm -hmm. And I understand that your experience wasn't so positive, which is really exciting to me because we hear so many of these positive experiences about seeing the beautiful light and angels and singing. And that's predominantly what we hear about in near-death experiences. But I know and I've got my own beliefs around why this happens. I know that there are many, many negative experiences out there, but they're not being talked about because, A, they might be too personal, too emotional, there's some trauma attached to it. There's a lot of different reasons why that might be happening. So I get so excited when somebody who's had a negative one is prepared to open up and share that experience. And I know, Kathy, that it's probably taken you quite some time to get there. Kathy, tell us a little bit about your experience. What happened and how did this start? I was taking care of a friend uh, who was my ex-fiance, actually. Uh, He got leukemia and he needed two caregivers to come up to Seattle to take care of him. So I volunteered, of course. He was my best friend. And um, it was very difficult. It was about five and a half months that me and his new wife, which was interesting in itself, uh, took turns taking care of him. I mean, one day he'd be good, his numbers would be good, and then it'd be bad. And then 
he'd wake up in the middle of the night and his nose would be bleeding. And we had this system where I'd run down to this darkened garage in a basement, get the car, come up to the front. She'd throw him in the front seat. We just ran ourselves ragged for five and a half months. We tried to have some fun. Every now and then the nurses would come in and say, well, who are you? And we take turns. I'd be the wife and she'd be the girlfriend. And then she'd be the girlfriend. And I'd be the wife just to try and lighten things up a little bit. Cause it was, he had a great sense of humor and that's pretty much what got us through. However, after eight and a half months, he died. And um, I just wasn't ready for it. I really wasn't. I really thought he was going to make it. But anyway, I had a friend say, why don't you just get away for a couple of days? Let's go down to Southern California. I'm going to be in a concert, you know, and, and you can listen to the music. It'll be great. Well, we got down there and there was this horrible flu that was going around. It was in 99 and it was it was wiping out people in Southern California. And I, my, my immune system was shot. So I got it right, right around Christmas. And um, uh, it was the respiratory thing. It is pretty much what's going around now. Uh, ARDS is what I got. That's acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that's pretty much what happens when you get flu and pneumonia together, your lungs fail. So um, I, I was very lucky. Well, I guess it's all pre-planned, but uh, I had called my friend in the middle of the night and I said, I'm, I'm really not doing good. I need some help getting to the, to the clinic. So he didn't really want to go with the middle of the night, but he took me down there. And as soon as I started to get out of the car, I had this weird feeling. It was like all my energy was just leaking out of my body. And I tried to get out of the car and I started saying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And that's all I remember. So I guess he picked me up, carried me in. They put me in an ambulance, no pulse, got me to the hospital, put me in intensive care. I couldn't breathe. So they trached me and, stuck me in this uh, drug induced coma for three weeks. And uh, I just went away. And it's so weird about being dead because you don't know you're dead. And yeah. uh, it's the weirdest thing. Uh, I, I, I've in my book, I've been writing this book for 20 years, trying to wow. get this experience just like out. Because I almost uh, almost every night think about it before I go to sleep. And I just wanted it out. So grab a Kleenex <laughs> and see if I could get through this. Uh -huh. A little dab here, a little dab there. Um, all right. I'm going to get serious. So all of a sudden, I'm nowhere. I didn't feel dead, only confused, total darkness and absolute silence. My only references, not daring to move, I waited. The blackness morphed into a reddish glow, dragging with it a stinking heat, acrid fog, muffled moans and ungodly shrieks. This can't be good. Something was staring at me like a blow. A voice thundered. Do you know where you are? My mind raced, searching for some rational explanation, but part of me already knew. Hell, I whispered. To my horror, the answer was this ear-splitting, maniacal laugh. The evil crept closer as I clamped shaking hands over my ears. Panic surged in me, triggering the requirement for fight or flight. Fighting was not an option. I turned and ran. So that was my introduction to the wow. afterlife. And I still didn't know I was dead. I was in hell for what seemed like about two years. It seemed to be segments like plays. And one situation was worse than the next. And the theme running through it, and there are demons, and they're not fun people. They're not people. But they kept trying to say, 
things like, if you'll just do this, we'll let you out. And, and when you, the first, <laughs> the first one was standing in this huge, huge, huge field, as far as you can see, a blackberry vines. And I don't know if you've ever been around blackberry vines, but we have them here. And they're very tough and they have big stems and they've got this wicked uh, thorns all over. Mm. So this horrible demon person says, um, you can get out. All you got to do, I still don't know where I am and what's going on. All you got to do is cut down all the vines. And I'm looking around thinking, yeah. And all of a sudden, here's this little pair of kindergarten scissors, you know, those little kids cut with them. Oh, yeah. And that's all I got, you know? And I'm thinking, I look at him like, this is a joke, right? But he's not a funny kind of guy. So I just lean down and all the, the thorns are tearing at me and I'm trying to cut this darn first one. And I got it cut and I started to go for another one and it just grew back. Oh. And this horrible creature just starts laughing, that horrible laugh. And I thought, they're just toying with me like a mouse and a cat, you know? And um, he says, you might as well give up. You might as well despair. You're never getting out of here. And somehow I just knew that didn't set well with me. I never could get this sense of God there. I never, I never thought, I was a Catholic. I was born and raised a Catholic. I couldn't think of Jesus or Mary or anybody calling on anybody. And I, I had to think about that later too. And I think that's because God is not wanted in hell. He's, and he doesn't go where he's not wanted. We've got free will. We don't want him. He doesn't go. So that, 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 when I finally said to the guy, I just kept cutting and I just kept saying, I will not despair. I will not despair. I will not despair. And boom, I would be in another place. And so there would be this other thing they would want me to do. And one was worse than another. There was this horrible abortion clinic thing going on. Mm. Uh, had to carry all these bloody broken babies from this one place and, and, and put them in this room. And as far as you could see, it was just mountains of these little babies. And I find, I came out after that one time and the, and the, the demon was standing there and he says, get over there and get back to work. You know? And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. So he raised his big club thing at me and I just closed my eyes and boom, I'm somewhere else. And it got worse. Each place I went was harder and harder, but I just wasn't going to give up. But finally, I was about at the end of my rope. I went through a couple really, you know, stuff I don't like to even talk about, much less read. And the thought of putting all of this out into the public and the shame I feel around all of this, ah, it took 20 years to do this. I'm now 74, and I jolly well don't give a bleep what people think anymore. My, my, yeah, my right. mother, I've, I've been waiting for my parents, my mother, I, I've had a rather, in, my mother calls it interesting life. She's 93. My dad's 96. They're still kicking. My dad's driving. My mother's still got all oh, these friends. Wow. I know it's so cool, but That's her, great. my whole life, she said to me, Kathy, someday you got to write a book about your life, but for God's sake, wait till we're dead. So, <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love it. It's just been the theme of my life. It's always got to bite that, but don't wait till we're dead. So now yeah. they're old, you know, and she's got dementia about halfway there. Uh, she remembers the things you don't want her to remember, you know, that kind of thing. Doesn't remember. Yeah. Do. It's, it's kind of so convenient. helpful. A little convenient. Yeah. <clears throat> so finally, at the last IONS convention, and those people saved my life, you know, they really did. Mm. Um, I, I I ran across a flyer that says, you know, publish your book. And all for 20 years, people say, you've got to write this down and tell people about it. And it's like, no, <laughs> I don't want to do it. It is so painful for me to look back on not only the hell thing, but the rest of my life. Uh, and and I mean, I've been through I, I should have bought stock in Kleenex. You know, uh, it it yeah. was just it was hard. It was really hard. So to Finally, I get it done. And my mom says, I want to read it. And it's like, no, <laughs> I don't want you to read it. It's, uh, 
she says, well, is it true? And I says, yeah, it's true. But I had to change the names to protect the guilty kind of thing. And uh, it's so sad, mom. I don't want you to hear it. I don't want you to think about it. it you're, like, you don't need that. So now she's saying, what are my friends going to think? And it's like, mother, <laughs> I don't mm. know. They're what they think, what they think. Okay. Um, so I've had a little blowback in that direction. But what really helped me was, you know, there are, I've learned there's no such thing as coincidences uh, because uh, I've just learned that. And I had this person give me a, uh, ask me to this, what was it? It was some kind of a seminar put on by his wife's friend. She could see spirits, you know, and I thought, hmm, I have a daughter that, that died at two days old. So it's, she would have been, oh God, 53. Um, I still think of her every day, but I thought yeah. that would be kind of cool to talk to my daughter. I really would like that. I want to know she's okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, so I, I thought, oh, I'll go. So I went and it was kind of interesting, but a little overwhelming. You know, she saw spirits everywhere and they were fighting to talk to one another. And and I guess my little girl couldn't make it through the crowd. So I, I kind of left disheartened. And mm -hmm. I thought I'm not going back to that. So about a month later, this guy says, you know, she's she's got somebody else coming this time. And and this guy says, I don't want to go to that. And she, he says, you've got to go. I've got to we've got to get you know, 40 people in there or else it's not going to work. So I said, fine. And what has developed, I'm jumping around, over the years, ever since I was a little child, and, and everybody has this, it's that voice in your head that tells you to do things. Um, it's not schizophrenia, <laughs> but you think sometimes it is. The way, in, the way I know <clears throat> it's not voices is that it usually tells me to do something I wouldn't want to do myself that's good that oh, might gosh. be difficult or put me out a little bit you know so um the voice since i got back was getting stronger and it was it was getting harder and harder to ignore in the old days before i went over i'd be in church you know i'd been to communion and i'm gonna you know they're playing nice music and i'll sit there and really think of jesus and i'd, I'd hear the voice you know hi i love you something like that uh, your mom needs, I don't know, take a, be a little nice to your mother. So, but when I got back, this voice is just getting louder and a little more insistent. It's like it's lost its filter. And so um, it says, you've got to go. You've got to go to this thing. I don't want to go to this thing. You got to go. You're going to meet somebody. But then I'm thinking I'm crazy. Okay. I don't want to go. I, last minute, five minutes to get there. I find myself in the car. I drive there. I get there. And I thought, well, I'm going to sit in a row that's only got, you know, I'm on the end, near the door. Mm -hmm. yeah. If by the yeah. time whoever this mysterious person wa doesn't walk in, I'm out. So I'm uh -huh. sitting there. There's, there's, it's pretty full, but there's chairs and there's two seats sitting next to me, you know, right? And so the lady is standing up there. She's going to introduce the speaker. And I thought, ha, get my stuff. Got my purse on my shoulder. And all of a sudden, these two girls burst in from the door, and I kind of look over there, and they come running over, and they say, excuse me, excuse me, and they sit over, and they sit next to me. Damn. So I thought, what the heck? And I look down, and in her lap, she's got this book that says near-death experiences on it. And I only vaguely heard that term, and mm -hmm. it's got her picture on it, and it's her. She wrote the book, and I thought, well, that's kind of weird. <laughs> So I waited to the break <clears throat> and she turned to me and says, have you had a near death experience? Wow. <laughs> I said, uh huh. And she says, me too. And I, oh no, she did not. She said, I, what, I said, you must have because you've just written this book. She's oh, me and my friend. She says, I didn't have one. And my voice said, yes, she did. And yeah. I said, uh, she says, we've just written this book. And she says, Oh, you have to talk to Greg Wilson. He's up at the IONS meeting. I said, what's an IONS? She says, it's in Seattle. Here, let me write down his phone number. And I'm going, what? What is this? She says, you have to talk to him. He will help you with your, your NDE. Mm -hmm. Well, I was in the middle of getting a divorce. And, and I had a lot on my mind. And I was depressed. And 
this card went in a drawer, you know, and um, a couple months later, I was about at my wits ends and I thought, hmm, maybe I'll give this guy a call. So long story short, he got me on the phone. He wanted to hear the story. He says, this is real. Only 20% of the people have bad experiences like you did, but it's valid. You really had it. You're not a bad person. This has meaning. This is something you're going to share with them. My mind was just whirling. And uh, so he, he says, you've got to come to a meeting. Didn't want to go to a meeting. Same thing. The voice said, get in the car. So I, I went, I ended up at a meeting like this. <clears throat> And, you know, of course, the people were talking about angels and lights and bells. And I thought, dude, this is not for me. So I waited. And then about a month later, the voice said, get in the car. You're going to meet somebody. I, said, I fell for that once. And he says, get in the car. So I get up there. And sure as hell, I get there early. There's It's going to be Eben Alexander, right? Never heard of him. Never heard of him. Yeah. But I thought, well, you know, he's a neurosurgeon. It might be interesting. So the place is almost empty. It's they got this big auditorium and they usually have this little tiny room in the library. So I had all these chairs and I thought, okay, okay, we'll play that game. So I went down in the middle, sat on the end. There's 15 chairs over this way. There's eight rows both ways, not a soul. And there's sprinklings of people. About five minutes later, here comes this person walk down the aisle. I thought I'm not making eye contact. So I've got my face, <laughs> face in the, like this. And, and, and she, I see her out of the corner of my eye and she goes past my row about three and she kind of cocks her head and she comes back, walks all the way down the 15 and sits right next to me and says, yeah. hi. And I said, hello. <laughs> so I thought, I, 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 I think I'm going to need medication or something. This is just getting too weird. So at the, the break, he was great, of course. And I, I just turned to her and I says, I was supposed to meet you today. She goes, I know. I says, what do you mean you know? And she says, my voice told me when I passed you, it said to go by and sit next to you. You are a nice lady. And I wow. thought, oh, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was hooked. So I started going to meetings. And finally, they talked me into telling my story, which I really didn't want to do. I had never heard a bad story there. I was so embarrassed. And, and it, it just, I didn't want to do it. But I'm a storyteller at heart. So once it started and I was able to kind of relax a little bit and I see these people kind of lounging in their chairs, starting to sit up straight, you know, they're starting to lean forward a little bit and mm. I got them, you know, <laughs> in the palm of my hand, they are with me on this trip. And, and when it got to be the end, I mean, they were sweating and it was like, are we going to ever get out of here? And, and, and the end, for those of you that don't read the book, um, has to do with the worst possible thing that happened. We're all sitting there, and these particular people and myself. And I said to this last demon, I didn't know it was going to be the last one, is this a particularly nasty day in hell or what? I mean, I've been here a while, and this seems a particularly bad day in hell. And she's, ah, it's Christmas on earth. It's always the worst day in hell. Oh. You know, things don't really make sense down there, but that, you know, after a while, you just accept it. And yeah. I just said, ah, uh, I started singing a Christmas carol. Well, that didn't go over well. And, oh. and the other people with me joined in. And she came unglued, the, I'll call her a she, this demon came at me. And I thought, well, I'm just going to go to another place, what I got to lose. But boom. All of a sudden, it's light, and I'm I'm not cold. I'm not hot. I don't. I'm not bruised, and there's nobody here. It's just white, and mm. I felt this infusion of love, and joy, and es ecstasy, and it's like, wh what happened? And I looked over, and there's my best friend. And, and he's standing there. And the last time I saw him, you know, he had cancer, his hair falling yeah. out. He was, he was horrible. Oh. And he looked great. And I'd known him for years. And I thought, wow, he looks great. You know, his gray yeah. hair's gone and, and he's lost a couple of pounds. And, and, and he's wearing that sweater I gave him last Christmas. Oh, wow. 
And I went, it dawned on me. I says, my God, he's dead. And he starts laughing. And I thought, he heard me. And I thought, well, he's dead. If he's dead, I'm dead. Oh, my God, I'm dead. Oh, it's great. I said, terrific. You know, he's doing a little jiggy over there. and, And I was so excited. And I looked around. And I thought, he's got that twinkle in his eye. Like, I know something you don't know. And I thought, uh oh, <laughs> there's a catch, you know? And I'm looking and I see this door. He's got this door behind him, but I can't see in it because I'm thinking, wait a minute. And there's supposed to be like angels and lights and flowers and stuff. This is just a white room. And then I looked over and there's this great big, like, architect's table with a huge book and it's open to this big page. And I thought, he was telling me something about that book. And I was, we were reading something in that book. And I said, oh, no, 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 this is going to be too hard. I want to just stay here with you. And then he said, now, Mary Kay, that's what he called me. You've got too much left to do. And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. Uh-uh. After, no, I'm not. going. And I just did that. I just said, no. Open my eyes, blinking around. It's bright again, but I don't feel so good. Uh, I just came out of the coma and yeah. I couldn't move. I weighed 86 pounds. Uh, I had no muscle mass. The only thing I could do was blink and wiggle this finger. And mm. here's, I see my son. I can't move my head. I can't, I, I can't breathe. Um, I got that thing in my, my mouth, my, they took it out of my throat, put it in my mouth and, or vice versa. I don't know, but I see my, my son-in-law and then I saw my mom and my daughter and they're all jumping up and down. Mom's back. Mom's back. Mm. I don't know what the hell's going on. And my mind's all clouded with all the drugs and stuff. And they, they're so happy. And I thought, who are these people? Mm. Why are they happy? Um, you know, this isn't, this isn't okay. Thank God I couldn't talk. I would have been rude. I got rude That's later. Right to say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just, and then my sweet daughter leans over and says, mom, you've, you know, you've been sick. You've been gone for th- three weeks. We didn't think you were going to make it wow. and you're back. And we prayed and we prayed and we brought you back. Uh, like I say, I'm glad I couldn't talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because later, uh, you know, I kept, you know, finally, it took it took quite a while for them to get that device they can stick in your throat so that you can talk like talk like a robot. But it was yeah. better than not being able to talk at all. And God bless them, they they made up a Ouija board for me to try and put my finger up to. And a Ouija board. I, you know, it looks like that. I thought, you know, I really didn't. I thought they were all a little nutty, you know, uh, doing all this stuff because I was still somewhere else doing. I wasn't quite back. And um, it was cute. They, they made it with letters on it because we did this thing where blink if it's yes and and don't blink if it's no. And I kept getting confused which one was which. And so they got this little Ouija board with little little figures on it, you know, A, B, C, whatever it was. But they had like X, Y, Z. So they'd say, okay, mom, how are you feeling? Or do you want more clevers? Or, or do you need a glass of water or something? And then they put that Ouija board like up here. I, I try and get my poor little finger to try to go up there. And so I'm spelling X, T, Z. And I mean, it didn't work. But Mm -hmm. it was a very long process. I was in the um, critical care unit for three more weeks. So that was a month there. Um, I couldn't sit up. I I couldn't do anything. Uh, uh, They had to tie me to a chair to try and get my back strong enough. Oh, God, that hurt. I was it it was spasm. And um, uh, I couldn't eat anything. And then the nurse accidentally pulled my feeding tube tube out and I couldn't tell anybody. And so she was mean. They left me on that uh, that thing thing you're supposed to go pee in the little bedpan thing underneath my, you know, little, I was skin and bone, no muscles. She left that under me and then forgot me. She was gone an hour. It was just an hour. 
And when she finally came, I couldn't talk then. And so on, it was awful. And I thought, I'm still in hell. I am still right. in hell. Yeah. So they finally, through a lot of things I try to make funny in the book, but they weren't funny at the time, like <clears throat> how the test they gave me to be able to move me to a rehab hospital so I could learn, <clears throat> excuse me, to walk, talk, crawl, <clears throat> do everything. I could, my muscles were gone, so I had no muscle memory. So I had to learn just like a baby. I had to learn how to do everything again. It was depressing. I never thought I'd ever get back to any sort of normal life at all. But they, my family was really kind and um, I did get out and it took me a good year to start to be able to be on my own, to like walk outside and walk back in. You know, you're mm. just afraid mm. and um, to walk to the end of the driveway and back. It took a year to, to this, do this big circuit that I walked uh, and it was down hills and up hills to where I finally felt like I got my life back. I was still thin, but, uh, and that's been 20 years and it still feels like yesterday. Mm. So then I had to deal with why, why did I go to hell? I wasn't that bad, you know? And I saw a couple of my relatives there who were living and I had, oh, messages. Okay. I had messages I had to give to them. And that was tricky, you know. Hi, I was just in hell. I got a message for you. You have yeah. got to stop doing this. <clears throat> Didn't go over well. I mean, they thought it was nuts. Um, yeah. So that was difficult. And then those words rang in my head. You've got too much left to do. What? Yeah. You're so happy to be in heaven. You don't want to come back here. And mm. they didn't give me a plan. They didn't give me a post-it note. They didn't give me any clue whatsoever all this stuff was. So I was mad about that. And uh, so it was a process. And so finally finding Ions, and I could tell the story. And, and at one point, Greg said, oh, you were a missionary to hell. That's why you were here. And uh -huh. I said, what? And he says, you went down there to tell all those people they didn't have to do those bad things and they could get out, not to despair. That's why you went. Oh, for the first time, I felt like maybe it was for a good cause. You know, maybe I did learn something and maybe I could share something. So little things started happening. Um, I had this thing about people in wheelchairs. Um, I was in a wheelchair and I was invisible and I looked awful. I had, you know, I looked like something from a, uh, I don't know, a Nazi concentration camp. I mean, my hair kind yeah. of fell out and, and I had yeah. no, I, when I smiled, I looked like a death mask. It was awful. Oh, it was terrible. Yeah. I was looking in a mirror. They were very nice, my family. They didn't let me look in a mirror for a month. But after I did, I thought, who is that poor woman? I was only 53 years old, you know, <clears throat> I, I was, I was cute back then, I, you know, and I was a wreck. So anyway, I got this affinity for invisible people and I made it, uh, uh, you know, even Seattle walking down the street with all the homeless people, you look in their eyes and you say, Hey, hi, you know, and all of a sudden they're visible. You don't have to give them money. Same thing with people in wheelchairs. Uh, I don't care what the age they are. Uh, people with disabilities, people standing on corners saying, can you give me five cents? Uh, mm. I found that when I did those things, invariably, they'd say, God bless you. I don't mm. care who it was. And that's how I knew. That was my feedback, that I had to be more aware. Uh, it was empathy now instead of sympathy. I mm. knew where they had been. And so I could give something I never could have given before. And another thing that happened over the years was I would hear, uh, it started off one day when I was saying to Jesus, you know, I really don't wanna go to hell again. 
is there some sort of formula? I mean, I, I'm a person that likes lists. I'm logical. Just give me a formula because I don't ever want to go there again. And it started mm. out with loving and kind, loving and kind. And I'd get up in the morning and say my prayers and I'd hear loving and kind. So I thought, okay, that, that makes sense. And then I'd go places uh, and I'd see something loving and kind or let's be loving and kind. And I thought, mm, that's weird. So I wrote it down and still... I had terrible memory problems. And then uh, like a month later, I heard merciful and forgiving. Okay, that's okay. So I will get you a card here in a minute. Um, loving and kind, merciful and forgiving. Months later, they always came in pairs. Loving and kind, merciful and forgiving, encouraging and grateful. Okay, I can do that. So I added that down. And then it was quite a while after that that I got non judgmental. And it dawned on me that when I heard these particular things, it was because I had a deficit of it in my life at that time. So that non judgmental mm -hmm. went zing. <laughs> that was a big one. Yeah. You know, because I, I don't know about you, but. I, Sometimes I'm just judgmental. And I, oh, I, 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 I kind of kid myself by saying, no, I'm observant. I'm just observing. I'm not being judgmental. Yeah. And it's like, no, that's not, not right. And then it was about, I wrote, started writing the book in earnest here, probably, I don't know, it seems like forever now, but maybe eight, nine months ago. And the last thing I got was useful. And I thought, huh. That's odd. And I thought, useful. What can I do that's useful that I've not been doing? And it's write the book. Mm. Came the voice. And I thought, oh, God, that's going to be too hard. And then I remember what I'd said in heaven to my friend. Nah, that's going to be too hard. So I, I uh, had picked up my publisher, who soon to be publishers, little flyer at the last conference. It was the last day of the conference. I'd walked by her little stand every day, how many times a day? And it says, write your own book, you know, and people in IONS had kept saying that. When are you going to write that book? People need to hear about that book. So I picked up her little flyer. She was just getting ready to put things in a box. And so when I heard that useful, I thought I've got that flyer here somewhere. And I found it. And I said, I think it's time to write my story. So she says, fine, write your story, send it to me. So I did. And it was, I don't know what it was, like 1,300 words or something like that, 2,000 right. words. It wasn't much. And she says, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to need about 40,000. I said, 40,000 words? I already gave mm -hmm. you all the words I got. And she says, no, 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 no. You're going to have to write about before this happened to you. Well, you've already got what happened at, this, at that time and what happened afterwards. How are you doing for time? You okay? We're doing great. Just carry okay. on, Kathy. This is so interesting. Yes. <laughs> so I thought, I can't, I can't, there's no way I can do that. I've been writing for 20 years. I would write a little chapter and then I'd put it in the folder and then it became a box and all that stuff. So I got the box out and I'm spreading this all out. And I thought, oh my God, how am I going to put all this together? This isn't, this just can't happen. And then I keep a picture of my friend from heaven, who is still my best friend, um, on my dresser. And, uh, and I just said to him, I can't do this, you know, and he, and, uh, he says, yeah, you can, you can just sit on a right. So I thought, fine. So I sat there at the keyboard and thought, okay, if anybody on the other side wants to have their say in this story, whether it's, you know, backwards or now or whatever, you're going to have to pitch in. And it was a miracle. Mm -hmm. It just started flowing. It was so much fun. It was like I was a stenographer. All these people had stuff they wanted me to tell. I would wake up in the middle of the night with my great grandmother saying, "Don't forget such and such." You know, it was, it oh, was fun. Wow. I, it was fun, and and I, 
I would call my mom up and say, you know, how many, you know, how old were you when this happened? Or I call my dad and say, how many, how many kids did grandpa have? And, and, and what was that story about such and such? And it mm. just turned into this wonderful story. And it went from beginning to end. It just came out. It, uh, and uh, I, I'd go to the word count, you know, I'd look at that and go, oh, 25,000. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know, I just kept Thank going. You but finally, I think she said, when I got to 40, I think she said it was 60. And I said, now, come on, you can't keep changing it like that. And I think I stopped at about 64,000. You know, I thought, okay, I'm done. Somebody, the editor is probably going to delete some of this, but I'm finished. So the editor went through some of it and she was darling. She says, wait a minute, you know, this should probably go here. Or what happened when your brother did that? Or you didn't tell me about this. And eh, maybe this part doesn't go in. She was great. And I've always heard that if you get a good editor, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing. But she was darling. We've never met face to face, but she was great. So she helped me kind of organize things and get it in order. And then, then I just gave it back and they had a test person who thought it was great. And, and I gave it to my boyfriend who thought it was fabulous, but I thought, well, he's prejudiced. And, um, <laughs> but it is a good story. And personally, I've read it. It's about a six and a half hour read. Oh, oh I don't know. 30 times. I yeah. still got to have Kleenex. I mean, I, it's, it's moving. It's, it's funny and it's sad and it's awful. And it's, I don't know, it's a good story. And I've had a lot of help. <laughs> like I yeah. say, with all, all these very brave people in my family that went through a lot. And what's interesting is when people read it, they say, wow, that sounds like my family. Or oh, we nice. had this in my, in my family. There was a lot of alcoholism in my family. Yeah. Uh, there was, you know, secrets. There was just like everybody else's family. And I think that's what's touching is that maybe I won't say I had the guts. I had the kick in the butt to get that story out so that maybe other people don't feel so alone. Um, yes, maybe. Yeah. So do you have any other questions you would like to ask? I do have a question. Has your mother read the book? You know what? She's in quarantine, you know, in, uh, yeah. about, where in my old hometown. And, and for three years, I've been going every month and staying 10 days to two weeks. And I'm glad because I thought they were going to die any minute. They're going to, they're going to live another 20 years. I know they are. And that's why I had to write the book now. But I, while they've been quarantined, I would read her a chapter, uh -huh. you know, at night, just a half a chapter because there's like 130 yeah. really short chapters. Yeah. And the problem that happened was she said, wait a minute, I didn't say that. And I said, I know mom. Now you're going to have to change that. I said, the book's gone to print, mom. I can't change it. Uh, and then she'd get mad. Well, my friends are going to think I'm mean. And I says, well, just tell them it's a novel. I, 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 I made things up, you know, because it, you know me, I've always been bigger than life. And so I made it up. Just tell them that. Yeah. Well, we had a, a cuff and my dad, he wrote the the opening one is um, the opening story or chapter is his pact with God in World War II. His plane was shot down over the Philippines. Mm -hmm. He was only like 19. My folks had just been married. She was 16. He was 19. He went off to wow, war. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, he got shot. His plane hit the beach. It did three somersaults, landed upside down with his cockpit broken. He is drowning in sand. He's been shot. He's got, you know, he was a mess and he was an yeah. atheist. And he'd been um, educated in St. Louis at one of the universities with the Jesuits and he used to fight with them all the time. And so there he is. He says, I'm dying. He says, look, God, if you can get me out of this mess, I'll become a Catholic. Just then the plane gets lifted up by three guys who came out on this beach oh, where wow. they're shooting people dying left and right. They got him. They cut him out. He had a broken back. They dragged him down the beach, got him onto a, you know, 
And so he went, hmm, <laughs> I yeah. guess we're going to become Catholics. So that's what started this whole family thing was, was my dad. Wow. And, and he had always said, you know, he didn't tell me that story till he, well, last year at his birthday, 96 years old. He finally yeah. told, he, he never talked about the war. Never, never happened. Yeah. So to tell that story, I says, dad, write that down. I'm going to use it in the book. Cause he, he said, you know, I, I don't want to die without this story getting out because there's other people yeah. involved. And he says, you know, I, I, I need you, I need you to, I need you to write this. So it's word for word. It's all in quotes. <clears throat> he wrote that first chapter, but it was a great way to kick off the book. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing, isn't it? So I wonder, do you think there's a chance that he had a near-death experience or um, he kept that in for such a long time, didn't he? He he had post traumatic stress. I know. Yeah, for sure. Um, he knew that was a miracle. Mm. You know, there was no way he should have survived that at all. Not at all. Yeah. There was too many mm -hmm. things that went wrong. <clears throat> and then the boat wouldn't take him back. He and this poor guy that were burned. He was all, the uh, friend was all burned up, and they said you can't get on the boat. This is in the middle of the war. The yeah. the battleship pulling out. They said you don't have any written orders. Oh my goodness. In yeah. orange suits with no ID, no money, no nothing, and they leave him on a beach in the Philippines. Oh, yeah. So God. that alone was a miracle how he got back. Yeah. Um, but so he loved when I told my story, you know, when I was trying to tell people after I came back and I I knew I couldn't tell them the hell part. I would just say hell part and they'd say it was the drugs. They didn't want to mm. hear about it. But to hear that I got to see my friend whom they all loved and um, that I was in heaven and it was great. That part they liked. Um, but the part about me changing and one of the questions you were going to ask here is, did your spiritual beliefs change? That was the hardest thing about coming back. It really mm. was. I'm still mm. struggling, still struggling. Um, uh, you know, a cradle Catholic. <clears throat> and then to get. To be with God and know that a lot of that stuff's not true. Mm. God loves us. There's no way he'll send anybody to hell. Um, he forgives you. He, he can't not. And it's not a he. he God is just God. Right. And God is everywhere and everything. And we're all pieces of him. And uh, so I had a lot of uh, hard questions. and. My dad and mom and I and my sister, she's a reborn. Uh, I got in a lot of disagreements and um, until I could talk to so many more people in Ions and, and get the feedback that that's how we all felt, you know, mm. that religion is not good. Spirituality mm. is what counts. And religion is just, it's divisive. It pits people against one another, and God doesn't want that. It's mm. uh, it's sad, but it's I I can't talk to many people about that unless I'm in my group. Yeah, and I understand that that's something that I hear a lot from experiences. I feel feel on a similar way myself that it's too big. It's too you can't confine it to something. So. It's an interesting thing to to look at and to try and, I guess, identify what it is. Um, my question for you is the voice. Now, I loved you talking about the voice, Kathy, because the whole reason that I run this podcast is because of the voice. Huh? I was driving my car. Yeah. I was minding my own business. I <laughs> had no intention to run a podcast. I hadn't talked about my own near-death experience at that point. Mm -hmm. And the voice came and the voice said, I want you to go and interview near-death experiences. <laughs> and I freaked out. And yeah, a long story short, I ended up going, okay, well, if, I know that you're not going to go away. I know that I have to do this. <laughs> we talked about that as well when you know that you have to do something. Yeah. So that's how I ended up doing this entire podcast. Cool. And I'd love to know from you, who or what is the voice? God. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. God, we call it conscience, your, your angel, uh, whatever, but it's just, 
it's just, uh, it's so many things are unexplainable with words. Yeah. You know, when know. you get to heaven, you just experience it. You know it. it, it it's just, yeah. it's just clear. And and then you get back down here, and it's like, oh wow, um, yeah. it's too big. But it's it's God in all of us, you know. And I love. I never, you know, we I was, we were taught not about reincarnation. That was a no no. And part of what I tried to do is, I have a friend who's a priest, and and I wanted him to read the book. <clears throat> And give me his feedback. And mm -hmm. he loved the book, loved the book, knew my family. They, you know, he's been in our family for 20 years and, and uh, longer, probably 30. But he says, Kathy, I, I just can't give you the old stamp. <clears throat> the church teaches there is no reincarnation. Uh, the church teaches this, the church teaches that. And I thought that's probably the best thing he could say about my book. <laughs> that the mm -hmm. church wouldn't agree with it because uh, I don't agree with it, you know? So yeah. it, was, it was confirmation that the, it's that voice thing saying, you know, it's got to be a, you, you came to do this, but it makes you happy now, right? Yeah. You feel fulfilled. Yeah. You feel a purpose. You, you're, you're giving all this to people that you could never do on a day-to-day -day basis, just walking around being a nice person in your hometown. So God works in strange ways. And if you just get out of the way, you know, he'll work. Yeah, for you. Exactly. I love that. I love that you came back with that sense of purpose as well of maybe not being quite sure what it was, but just knowing that you had more to do, which was the message from your friend. Did you ever get to an understanding? I know you touched on, you went to hell. You talked about being a missionary to hell. Now, the big thing for Why me. Why did I, you go to hell? I think I went to hell because I planned it. I was okay, a Catholic. You're have to expand on that. I was I was a Catholic. And 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 we were taught that, you know, if you do a good deed, you say a rosary, you say four masses, you get 300 days indulgence. That meant you got time off purgatory. All right because it was pretty much understood that almost everything you did that was fun was bad. And you would get bad, you know, if you lied, you cheated, you steal, you cheated, whatever it was, you got time in purgatory. So it became a math problem. So you, you'd say, oh, I wasn't very nice to my sister, I'll say a rosary. You know, and it was kind of my whole life, I bought into it. So I accepted it. I signed on the dotted line. And so knowing I was going to go to purgatory, I would, you know, put a lot of stuff on the good side and I lost track somewhere. <laughs> and I think that was part of it. I expected to go to purgatory. So I did. And so coming back, I thought, uh, how do I unthink that? And that's why I went to God and says, Tell me how not to do that again, because I don't want to. And that's the number one thing. You don't want to. You want to go to heaven. You believe you'll go to heaven. You know God is loving. You know God will forgive you. Because I start hearing all these stories that people say, I was an atheist. I killed myself. I, you know, I, and I went straight to heaven. And it's like, well, there's something wrong with this picture, you know? And I think that's it. You, you condemn yourself. I condemn myself. And I, mm. I'm not going to do it again. But there's that little, that's funny. My sister, who was a reborn Christian, when I when I came back, I was telling her, Donna, she says, she's, I've always, she's always says, when I die, I'm going to jet into the arms of Jesus. And so, um, yeah, I said, that's nice for you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, but I've been to hell and there is a hell and, and you better have a plan B. And she yes. thought about it and says, Nope, I'm jetting straight to Jesus. And I thought, <laughs> why can't I do that? And it's just something I've, I've had to undo in my religious upbringing is to tear that, peel it off layer after layer and trust in God's love because I know mm. I've been there and that's where I want to go. Mm, totally, totally. It's so interesting because like I said in the introduction, so many people don't talk about the negative experiences. I would love to know, and I don't know that we can actually know what the percentage rate would be 
whether, it, you know, 50-50 people have negative versus positive. Is it just the positive people talking about them? Yes. It's, yeah, it's so interesting. I love that you're prepared to talk about this, Kathy, because I think it's so important to understand that it isn't always the white light, the angelic, the happy experience. And so as you were down there, you said that you saw some people in hell who you mm-hmm. recognized who were still living at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How many people are we, are we talking? Lots of people or a, or a couple? No, just two. Just, just two. two. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. And, and the first person I talked to, uh, it didn't go well. Uh, it just didn't go well. So she and I, our friendship was ruined. Um, mm. The second person um, I told, but they just, but then about 15 years later, this person was in a situation similar to where I saw her in hell. And she says, tell me about that again. And I did. And she was in a place right then in her life where she felt like she was in hell and was doing the same things I saw her doing. And they were innocuous things when I saw them and innocuous when she was performing them. It was just daily routine things, but it was the person she was with that was having her structure her life this way. She lost herself. Mm -hmm. Um, And so she got divorced and went through a really hard time. But then she came back, she found this wonderful man, got married, and is uh, happy. But um, I foresaw that. You know, I I didn't. I mean, I did it. I saw it. I saw her in that situation. Mm -hmm. So now that I told her, you know, later, she says, now I feel vindicated. I don't feel bad about tearing my family apart, taking the kids away from their dad. That was Mm -hmm. a hell. And I needed to get out of there um, because she was anorexic and, you know, talking like she wasn't wanting to be here anymore. So that worked out well. So 50-50. But it was weird to see somebody because I didn't think I was dead at that point. I just thought I'd fall through a rabbit hole somewhere. And uh, because you didn't really have time to stop and think because you're always trying to stay ahead of, and away from all this terror and danger and darkness. And, oh, man, it was nasty. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I know we probably just tipped on the top of the iceberg on your story here. So yeah. I really encourage our listeners to go and check that story out. So it's Misfit in Hell to Heaven Expat. And Kathy, I thank you so much. I have a lot of questions. I'm aware of timing. As you know, I said we're in the power cut, so I'm aware that I'm going to run out of battery soon. So we've got this far. I love how all these things happen, with, especially with near-death experience interviews. There's always some issues going on behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. So I'd well, love I want to get you back. Thank you to you, or this wouldn't be possible. Keep listening to that voice. You did, oh. you did, you did good. You know that voice. You can't say no to the voice. I and mean, it told me three times. It told me. It didn't ask me. It told me, you will do this. You will do that. And, yeah, here we are because of the voice. So I That's love that right. you get the voice. I love that connection. Thank you, Kathy Thank McDaniel, you. for sharing your story. And we'll put the link to the book in the show notes. If you're listening, go and get the book. It is amazing. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Let's Talk Near Death podcast show. If you've enjoyed it, please share it with your friends, tell people about it. I'd love to get these messages out there. Don't forget you can also pick up your VIP access pass for additional content at patreon.com forward slash Kirsty Salisbury. You can connect with us via the Let's Talk Near Death Facebook page and I look forward to catching you for another episode soon.